Hey guys, it's Sam and today I'm answering some questions that I got for a cancer related Q&A. If you are new to me and this channel and just stumbled across this video, I usually make videos on my main channel all about books and this channel is my more personal channel about all my other interests so I decided to keep everything cancer related on this channel because I was diagnosed with cancer in 2015 and I am in remission as of April 2016. So I asked my subscribers on my other channel to ask some questions which I'm going to be answering here. This video might be in multiple parts because I did receive a lot of questions and I said in that video as well that I was going to do more detailed videos about some questions so I'm going to answer as many as I can and we'll just go from there. For the most part I am not going to be naming off usernames for any of these questions because a lot of them were asked multiple times in multiple different ways and there's no reason to add usernames or anything. If there was a specific question that I want to answer to that specific user, I will list their username. So the most common questions was what kind of cancer were you diagnosed with? I do not answer specifically what kind of cancer I had because a lot of times on the internet people feel like they are doctors and once you say something about the kind of cancer that you had, they decide to rattle off all these facts that they know about the d death rates and the success rates, all this stuff that I personally don't need to know and people that are reading the comments don't need to know, especially if they've been recently diagnosed. So I had a blood cancer, a type of blood cancer, and that's the most that I put on the internet because that's really all that matters, honestly. Another very popular question was how was I diagnosed or how did I find out that I had cancer? I do plan on doing a full vlog about my diagnosis because I do think that it's a very common thing for people that are young adults with cancer because the medical community is still kind of figuring out that young adults can get cancer. So you'll go in with a symptom and they'll rule out cancer for a lot of things and it ends up being cancer. So I think my full diagnosis story would be a good thing to share. But basically I had a pain right below my sternum for months actually, but I thought it was a hernia. I got diagnosed with a hernia and then I went to a gastroenterologist, did a couple of scans, he diagnosed it as an adenoma. I went to a surgeon, we had surgery, and they took out about 20% of my liver, but when they got in there they realized it wasn't an adenoma. Adenomas are benign tumors and they can never become cancerous. But they saw my tumor and discovered that it was actually a cancerous tumor diagnose it and everything. It took a couple days and stuff and I was actually recovering from surgery for a while there and then was diagnosed with cancer. Another related question people had were what are the symptoms of my cancer? I was actually an atypical case. What I had and how I was diagnosed was very different from most people so that kind of affected my treatment because it's not typically how it is diagnosed. The symptoms that most people have and that send them to doctors and stuff I actually didn't have and I've never had. So it was a very weird case and I honestly believe that if I just would have gone to a primary care physician I would have never been diagnosed because I wasn't flagging for my typical symptoms for my typical cancer. I actually got a question from a girl who was an oncology nurse and she asked what can they do as medical professionals as far as what I feel was lacking when it comes to providing good care or maybe something that I wish the nurses or doctors did when I came in for appointments. I actually had really excellent doctors. Like my doctor is amazing. I really really loved him and I really loved the oncology nurses and the chemo nurses that I had. I actually had one who was the head nurse of that unit and she kind of took me under her wing immediately. The thing about being a young adult with cancer, which can be either positive or negative depending on how you feel about it, people aren't used to seeing it so when they see a young adult come in with it they immediately like mama bird you kind of and they're just there's a little extra oomph I feel like that you get as a young adult which is great but is also like young adult cancer is becoming more common so this is going to start be more of the norm and stuff but I got treated really well. I loved all of my chemo nurses. I think chemo nurses and oncology nurses are amazing, wonderful, wonderful people and I don't know how they do it all the time but I witnessed so many just loving things that they do with their patients because they are so attached to them because again you're dealing with a lot of cases that are like end-of-life care, right? So like you become basically family with these people, like you're seeing them really often. I had infusion every three weeks so we were seeing them all the time and we were like talking about their lives and everything so I really loved my doctors and my nurses and everything. I had bad experiences more so with my hospital stays and hospital nurses. Again it was just the area I think that I was in in the United States. I was going to a hospital in Philadelphia. The hospital itself is world renowned, really amazing, really great and again with hospitals your care will kind of depend on the floor that you're on. So my particular floor I just I stayed there twice, three times I forget. I was there a few times because I was there after my 
surgery and then I was there a few stays for like infections and stuff like that that I had while going through treatment. But I am not a fan of that particular floor and everyone was very not good with bedside manner and you know you press your call button and they don't get there within you know like 15 minutes and you know if you're bleeding on the floor because of your IV they just say like that's what veins do you know stuff like that I'll have stories about that so hospital stay wise I was not a fan bedside manner was mediocre at best at this particular hospital and they did not treat people as if they were people they treated them more like test subjects kind of a little bit um, and but that was not the attending doctors that was residents and some of the nurses and stuff so yeah I was not a big fan of the residents at all whenever we had residents in there I was not a fan there was a couple residents that I really enjoyed and the most recent visit that I had and I really liked one of the guys in particular who was really cool and was trying to get me out of there as fast as possible because he knew I was miserable but other than that a lot of them you know didn't treat patients very well especially after surgery I had doctors coming in and just like lifting up your gown because you just have like a gown on checking my incision but also just like not asking and I know that they're doctors but you're like naked and it's just like a dignity thing and just talking about your scar or your incision like you're not there that kind of stuff was really not fun but oncology people on um, you know and actual like chemo infusion areas top notch so this is a specific question, so I'm going to name the username for this. Her name is Leanne, and she said that her sister has stage 4 liver cancer, and the doctors have given her 6 months to live at the age of 26. And her question is, how did I keep positive? How can we, the people around her, help her survive and keep her positive? I don't lose my big sister, but I know it's pretty much unstoppable. I know I have to stay strong for her, but it's hard. My second question is, how do people around you impact you when you're going through this? I don't want to do anything to bring my sister down. So... This is a hard question to answer. You can already tell I'm getting like a little whew about it because again, that's like my similar situation. I wasn't, I didn't have a really bad prognosis, but I was stage four and it is scary and I did not have any kind of deadline. They were pretty convinced that they would be able to cure it. This kind of cancer I had at stage four, you can cure, which is amazing, but you still hear stage four and it's very scary. And I'm very sorry to hear about that and with your family and everything. As far as staying positive with me, I made sure that I kept up certain hobbies. Again, it is difficult. I did not leave my house. I was pretty much quarantined. My white blood cell count dropped really, really abysmally low and basically I had no immune system. So I did not leave my house at all um, once that started happening and booktube and doing videos kept me sane. I have a lot of actually, you know, indoor kind of hobbies anyway, so I had reading, which I didn't do a ton of because I was feeling very sick, but I had that and I had like video games, which I did when I didn't have a massive headache and stuff like that. As far as keeping positive for her, I obviously encourage you to, but one of my biggest things is people treat cancer patients with kid gloves, like the people around them treat them with kid gloves, and it can be even more just like disconcerting slash you don't really want pity and it's like that becomes your whole life and people just want to like tell you how sorry they are which it is true like yes it sucks like thank you for telling me like you're sorry but a lot of times for, with me I was better and it just depends on the person obviously but when people told me like that fucking sucks and I'm sorry but like that's bullshit and like that sucks and were angry with me that felt better and that felt more genuine because it was just like especially if people reached out to you and this isn't this isn't true for family but people that are like you know not close close friends or family um i didn't want to really hear like oh from those people it was more like i want to hear like that fucking sucks because it does and especially i feel like people that are young adults with cancer we react more with anger and frustration because it is bullshit <laughs> and like obviously it's never good to have cancer obviously like it's not like you were going to be like this is expected when you're older, but at the same time, people that are older have more of a chance to prepare for that. Um, people that are older are more likely to encounter other medical problems that will prepare themselves for not necessarily like cancer, but they're more well equipped for like the skills and just the mentality when they're older. You know, you've had more friends pass away, you've had more stays in the hospital, potentially you've had more like illnesses, stuff like that. So young adults, it's like you're in the, you know, in your 20s, you're supposedly in the prime of your life and it's like it's angering so I'm getting on a tangent but I encourage you to encourage her to feel whatever emotion she needs to feel to not necessarily say that she always has to be positive because especially with a prognosis like that like she needs to feel like she can have whatever emotion that she needs to have with that obviously I hope that you and your family and her are in some kind of counseling I encourage some kind of therapy with that because 
there's so many emotions with that between all of this and just moving forward depending on whatever the outcome ends up being I'm obviously hoping and sending positive energy your way that the prognosis that that they gave her is incorrect and there's obviously people that have gotten prognosis like that and have lived and lived long healthy lives so I hope that is true but in any rate no matter what happens you're gonna have to have some kind of coping all of you and I think going to a therapist and finding a good therapist for that is definitely encouraged. But like I said, just letting her feel the emotions that she wants to feel. Definitely um, getting down in the dirt with her if you need to and letting her vent whatever way. You know, not just staying strong necessarily for her. I definitely encourage you not to say like how hard it is on you to her because obviously no matter how hard it is on you or anyone around you, she has it the hardest. Um, so that can be something that families do unintentionally and I'll talk about that more in a future question. But definitely encouraging her to feel whatever she needs to feel, not feeling like she has to be strong for you guys or you guys necessarily feeling strong for her. Like, if you're sad, you can definitely, you know, say that to her and encourage her to come out with whatever emotions that she has, whether she's pissed off or frustrated or scared or sad or whatever. As far as families, and I just kind of touched on this a little bit, and people that are close to cancer patients, you definitely want to stay away from not making it about you. And you can, it can be hard, I know that families don't do it intentionally, and in an attempt to commiserate, I think they will say stuff about how hard it is um, to the patient, but at the same time, the patient's at the center of this problem, right? So they're going to be dealing with the brunt of it, no matter what happens, no matter who the caregiver is, or the family, or whatever, like, nobody else has it worse than the patient does. So sometimes family members and caregivers will have a tendency to talk about how hard it is on them, and to share with the person their stressors too, and that's the worst. Um, my mom, I love her to death and she is a wonderful person and she ha came out a lot when I was ill, like almost every month, but she still to this day has a tendency to tell me how stressful it is on her and how hard it was for her and it makes me mad. Um, and it's something that I've kind of said like, you know, I, I understand and I validate that it was hard on parents and siblings and whatever, but that's not something that you tell to the person who's going through it. That's something that you tell other people. So I definitely encourage you um, with frustrations and stuff or how hard it is on you to talk to people around you that are in the same circle. So your other family members, not necessarily with your sister, talking to them about it and making sure that you guys form a good unit because you can't say that to her because that's just going to cause like frustration and stuff with her. But again, like it's doing it in a way where you encourage her to feel her feelings, but not twisting it and making it about you. Um, parents have a bad tendency to do that from what I've heard from people, um, moms especially. Um, my dad was really good about not saying stuff to me and my dad and I have a very similar personality so it might be why. So he kind of knew but my mom would tell me how hard of a time my dad was having even though he wouldn't tell that to me and I did not need to hear that. Like I did not need to hear how devastated and how freaked out my dad is because if you hear that about like your parents it's like you know your inner child is like ah so yeah, long story short, um, encourage her to feel the emotion she needs to feel. It definitely all get in therapy, but make sure that your family is a strong unit and if you have frustrations and fears, talk to it with your other outside family members, not with necessarily her. And I hope for the best. I have heard of plenty of people who have had stage four and have had bad prognoses and are now alive still. So I hope for the best and your family and her do not deserve that, and I hope for the best for all of you. Another question I got was, how did I tell my family and friends? I chose to, the day that I found out that I had cancer, I was like, I am telling everyone that I want to tell. Now, I didn't tell everybody. I obviously didn't tell all of BookTube and anything. I did not go on, like, Facebook and tell people. I told my family and my, like, close family. Um, I told Gerald's family, um, and I told my closest friends, but I did not tell, like, some of my closer friends I didn't even tell. Um, a lot of my friends are around the country, so we're not necessarily close by to each other, but I told my two best friends, one of which lives in Philadelphia where my hospital was, and the other one lives in Colorado, so I told them like immediately. Um, and I told my family, obviously. So right after I found out, I called my best friend who lives in Philadelphia, and I was like, I need to see you. And her mom passed away from breast cancer when she was like 19. Um, so this I knew was going to be, and you know, you don't want to necessarily like, obviously it's hardest on me as a patient, but I was like, oh my God, I have to tell my best friend whose mom passed away, who has like a huge issue with cancer, you know, like this. 
But I was like, I have to tell her in person. Like, I have to go and tell her in person. And she had to have known, like, what was happening. But she, and she did. Like, she immediately was like, I need to leave work, you know? Um, so we were out in, like, the corner of, you know, downtown Philadelphia. And I was like, she just walked up to me and I was like, I have cancer. I mean, like, so I'm, like, smiling because it's not funny. Um, but I need to do that immediately. And I need to tell her first. Um, because that's my person. <laughs> and I need to tell her immediately. Um, because it felt like it wasn't real until I told my, like, best friends and family. Um, and then I went and I said I want to talk to my parents together. Um, so I FaceTimed them because I don't live close to my parents, so they live in Illinois. And, um, I FaceTimed them. I said, as soon as you're together, because I'm not doing it separately. Like, I tried to get everyone together as much as possible with it, so I called them. That was hard, obviously. I tried not to cry, obviously. Uh, I didn't know what my, like, exact prognosis was at that point, but every time that I knew something more, I would call them group. Um, and they didn't actually break down, like, on the phone with me, which was really good. They broke down after, and then, like I said, my mom told me, which is, like, counterproductive. Um, we went and told Gerald's aunt and uncle, who he's very close with, live they live two doors down from his parents, so we were waiting for his parents to go home, went and told his aunt and uncle, and then went and told his parents in person. Um, again, everyone's very, like, cool. you don't know what to do, you know, because his parents and his aunt and uncle are in their 70s, and they're like, what? Um, so that was, yeah. And then I called my other best friend who lives in Colorado, FaceTimed her, poor thing, she didn't know, so I got on the phone with her, and she started kind of ranting about her day, right? And she was like, you know, I've, she was, was like at Ikea or something, and she was talking about, like, how she couldn't find the right size of something and whatever, and she's like, so how are you? And I let her do that because I was like, you know, this is my last, like, normal conversation with her for a little while, right? So, um, and then I said, you know, like, I found out my results today, and she's driving, and she's like, yeah, you know, she had her phone down, it's dangerous, don't do that, but she had her phone down a little bit, and she was kind of, like, had it in, like, a cup holder, and, um, she, like, pulled over on the side of the road, and I was like, yeah, so, cancer... And she just starts like bawling and she's like, why did you let me talk about my day? And I was like, you know, I'm not going to lessen your problems because I have a big one, you know, but she was just like a mess and she's like, you're going to be fine. You're going to be fine. And that's the best thing about my friends is like my friends handled it arguably better than any of the family members. Um, the family members, since everyone's older, um, are used to death sentences when it comes to cancer. Like, they're used to people, like, having friends when they were younger, like, die. Like, even in, like, the, you know, 80s and 90s and stuff. So, like, they still can't process that, like, cancer is treatable and curable. And so they handled it, like, my family handled it way worse. And my friends, like, still treated me very normally and wouldn't necessarily, um, ask about it unless I said something about it and that was really great so my friends were like the best through all this like all of my friends all my book two friends that knew and all of my you know, other friends that knew and my like best friends that knew like they handled it the best um and they were a savior as far as that goes because like I said my parents and just family in general handled me more with kids gloves and um weren't they did their best but it wasn't as beneficial as it could have been. And again, like, what are they supposed to do? They don't know. So that was my whole, like, telling everybody. One of the questions was that I have pre-existing knowledge that this could happen to me or was out of the blue. My particular cancer is not genetic, so I had no idea that this could happen. I do have other people in my family that have had cancer, like grandparents and stuff, but they were unrelated cancers. Um, one was a grandparent that had melanoma and the other one had bone marrow. So they were not related cancers. Um, I did ask my oncologist and he said that the type of cancer that I had like just happens. They haven't quite figured out why exactly my particular one happens. There's a number of different things that can kind of lean it one way or the other. But again, when I looked at those different things, like I don't match up with any of those. So it is not genetic. I know for a fact that my dad, I think, does feel that, um, not blames himself, but his dad was the one that had bone marrow, and so I think he still kind of relates it to, like, this was genetic and it was his genes. It's not, it is not my genes' fault or anything. It is not even anything that I did. Um, the things that, and not that you should blame anybody for their cancer. Like, I don't care if somebody smokes 12 packs a day and they get lung cancer. Like, they don't deserve that. Or if they, like, drink themselves into an early grave and get liver cancer. Like, it doesn't matter. But, anyway, there's nothing that I did to that, like, upped my odds or anything. It's just one of the things that, like, just kind of happens and they haven't quite figured out why yet. Another question was, how did you stay positive while you were sick and how did you manage to keep your YouTube channel going throughout? Um, as far as positivity, and a lot of people have told me afterwards, they're like, oh, you're, you know, you're so strong and you're so positive. And 
I'm gonna do a full video on that about like this strong cancer patient trope. And again, people aren't saying that to be mean or to be not to be mean, but to be um, they're not saying that for to make me feel any kind of way. Um, but it is something where we do kind of construe sick people as either people to be pitied or people to be um, exalted and looked up to. And it is something that I have always found rather irritating and um, isn't as beneficial as people think that it is. But I do understand that it did take a certain amount of mental fortitude, I guess, to keep my channel going. And that was an entirely selfish reason. Um, I needed it to keep going because I needed to have an outlet. Um, I wasn't you know, going out or doing anything. And I don't have a lot of friends around here anyway. Like I said, a lot of my friends are like, you know, spread out around the country. And I couldn't see people anyway because of my immune system. So I needed something that wasn't cancer. That's why I didn't say anything about it on there. Even when I started wearing wigs and losing my hair, um, I did not mention what it was. And I needed something completely separate. And it was such a blessing to like have something to talk about and to do and to distract myself while I was going through it. So as far as staying like positive with that, um, I wouldn't necessarily say that I was positive. Um, when I was diagnosed, I r distinctly remember leaving the hospital, turning to Gerald and saying, like, I am not going to be, like, the pretty, nice, meek cancer patient. Like, I'm pissed off. My, um, initial reaction with bad news, and a lot of people's, is anger. So I was not, like, the beaming positivity, I'm gonna beat this person. Like, I was kind of, like, I'm gonna beat this in a I am pissed way, and, like, this is fucking stupid and I am like no like I'm not going down like this kind of way but I would not say that that's necessarily positive um a lot of my emotions throughout were more frustration and anger because frustration and anger as far as your emotions are more likely to pop up because it's easier than fear and being scared so obviously I was like scared and I use anger and frustration a lot more um so yeah I wouldn't necessarily say that I was positive like again I did the best I could. I didn't completely lash out at people or anything. Like, all the time I wasn't, like, a horrible bitch. Um, but if I didn't feel well, like, I didn't feel well. And, um, you know, there were times where someone would say the wrong thing and I would, like, kind of, you know, get mad. Um, but as far as staying positive on YouTube, again, that was just kind of a, this is me having an outlet. And um, I am positive about books. And I did my YouTube on days when I didn't feel bad. So I guess one of my other questions is kind of like, how did I keep it going when I was so sick? Um, with my infusion and my treatment schedule, I had infusions every three weeks. So for the first week is when I felt like horrible shit. And then a few days after, I was still like kind of foggy, but I could, I could function a little more. Um, and then for those like two weeks or like week and a half, I was pretty much okay. Um, you know, still like weak and still um, not having really good as far as like taste and stuff like that, different chemo symptoms, but um, not feeling horrible or having horrible headaches or like any of that. So I would pre-film a ton um, in those times. So I would, even now I bulk film and I bulk film before I got sick. So I would film at least like five videos at a time and maybe switch up wigs or whatever so that people couldn't tell that it was all in one time. But for the most part, I just bulk filmed and then had maybe even like a month's worth of videos up and made sure that like it, when I needed to film again, it wasn't like right around the time. And I managed to keep my schedule the whole way through. I think the only video I missed might have been around like a surgery thing because I didn't recover from surgery as quickly as I thought I was going to. Um, surgery sucks um, in a different way. The chemo sucks. But I had massive... Um, you know, abdominal surgery, so I have a very giant scar on my abdomen, um, and that sucked. Um, so I think that's the only time that I might have missed like one or two videos. But otherwise, I kept it for the most part. But like I said, not necessarily uh, for positive, you know, feelings, positive beam of energy, because I don't feel that I was necessarily a positive beam of energy. Um, it was depressing. It's a depressing time and I honestly do not know how people go through chemo for years. Like I know it's because you just need to do it to live, but I don't know how people do it because even my like second and third infusion I was like I do not understand how people do this and I fully now understand people that say like they don't want to continue with like chemo. Like I, before I was like how do people stop their chemo treatments? Like who would ever do that? And now I'm like I completely understand why people do that. Like, if I would have had a long-term diagnosis of having to have it for years and years and years, like, I completely understand people saying, like, I don't want to do this anymore. This is horrible. So, yeah. I mean, not the happiest answer. Um, 
but I do thank people who do, you know, compliment my, like, mental strength about it, I guess. Um, but I will do a full video on, like, the strong, sick person trope. There's obviously a lot of questions about chemo, and I also do plan on doing a chemo type video answering all the questions about that and just general questions about that. I know people do have a lot of misconceptions about it, and I didn't really know anything about chemo before I had it. I only knew that people are nauseous. That was like the only thing. And again, people really aren't nauseous anymore. That's a, a misconception that I guess people have about it. Um, chemo has come a long way as far as anti-nausea medications. So I had two anti-nausea medications pumped in, infused, before my other chemo medications were infused. So that nausea medicine lasts for like four or five days after you have your infusion. And then if you have any breakthrough nausea, you do get sent home with like nausea, anti-nausea pills and stuff, but I really didn't experience any. I experienced it once towards the very end. And it's not the same kind of nausea that you have with like the flu or anything. It's like, you can just puke at any moment. Like you feel, I never did throw up, but you feel like you can puke at any moment. Um, it's really weird. It's like not necessarily like a stomach thing. It's just like, I could puke. Like, I could puke at any second. Um, but they really have handled the whole nausea thing a ton. As far as my chemo, I had four different kinds of chemo, actual chemotherapy drugs, and then I had a biologic, which is something that they're doing with chemo a lot now. And it's like a separate thing, and it is a live, you know, biological thing. And it basically shows the chemo where to go. So instead of like it racking your entire body, which it still does, but like without it, you know, just going every which way, it kind of focuses it on the areas, on the cancer areas, because it kind of seeks out the cancer. It's kind of cool. Uh, very high tech. So I had that. And my chemo symptoms were all over the place, kind of. I had really massive headaches. I also had spinal infusions. So I had my overall like body chemo that people are used to that you get infused through your veins. Well, I had a port. Well, this is my port. This is a scar. I have keloid scars, which means I get raised scars. Not everyone would have this, but you can kind of see my port underneath it. So if anyone's ever wondering, that's what that is. So a port is so that you can get chemo infusions without being poked with a needle in a vein every single time because it can really fuck up your veins. Um, as it is my veins, I have a lot of scar tissue because, because of getting like blood draws and stuff. But as far as infusing it through there, it's not a good idea. So they infuse it through this. So I had that kind of chemo, but I also had spinal infusions because sometimes you can get cancer cells within your spinal fluid. And people probably know about the whole like brain blood barrier thing. So your spinal cord stuff isn't attached to everything else, like your brain fluid and whatever, your spinal fluid. So I had a separate kind of chemo in there. And that sucked too, because it's like a lumbar puncture every time. I'm not going to talk a ton about needles, because I know some people are really bothered by that. But I had those different kinds of chemo. And all of that added up to me having really, really bad headaches. Like, headaches for a week. And not headaches that you can take medicine to get rid of, because it's not being caused by, like, an actual, like, biological, you know, like, lack of water, dehydration, any of that. It's just, like, horrible horrible pain, like no matter what kind of pain medicine I took, it didn't matter. And I really only get any relief laying down and it was still like pressure. Um, but that was from both the chemos. Um, obviously hair loss, duh. Um, people don't like talking about this and they never really mention it, but like constipation is a huge thing. Your whole body basically shuts down. Your whole digestive system basically shuts down. So you basically feel like an old person and you basically have to get that going. Otherwise you can be hospitalized. I never had to be hospitalized for that, TMI, but it is a thing. I also had some nerve damage things that happened. It did go away, but you get, um, I forget what the name of it is off the top of my head right now, but people can get nerve damage and basically starts with their fingertips and the tips of their toes and it works back. So I had some numbness all the way up here and it was numbness with tingling. So basically like I couldn't touch things. Like I couldn't do certain stuff. I couldn't pick things apart. Anything with my fingertips I couldn't do. Um, writing was difficult. It, it hurt. It like burns. It's like just like needles. Like at one point I was holding like a mesh bag in a store. Um, we were, Gerald and I were getting something. Um, and this was before I was like fully quarantined or whatever. And I had to hand it to him because I was like, I can't hold this. And it wasn't heavy. It was, it was light. And he looked at me. He's like, what do you mean you can't hold it? And I was like, it's my, it's my fingertips. So we ended up um, going back a little bit on the medication. So that was good because I ended up finally regressing and not getting bad again. But um, as far as chemo, like they really base your chemo dosage on your body weight, but that isn't the only indicator. So it gets adjusted throughout treatments. Like because you'll figure out like, oh, this is hitting your system too hard. You can get a little less while still killing the cancer. Like, so there's a lot of adjustments made. So that was one of the things that happened. Um, body temperature wise, there was a lot of like issues with that. Um, I was basically getting like hot flashes a lot, especially in the first couple of months, um, which suck by the way. Um, I 
didn't have any sweating, but it was just like hot instantly. It would happen like every 10 minutes, which is just awful. Um, so body temperature things happened, and then after that hot flash phase passed, I still to this day am a little more cold than I used to be. Um, so I, it's not like I can regulate as well as I used to. Um, mouth things are an issue as far as like mouth sores. I didn't necessarily get like sores, but at one point I, I prevented it for the most part because they give you a lot of things to do, like different um, toothpaste you can use. And I did like a rinse um, every night that was a, like a baking soda rinse to just keep everything like pH good. Um, but at one point when I was like, I'm, I'm sickest obviously, um, I had had like a whole mouth, not infection, but it was like all my gums were raised um, and inflamed and painful, like I couldn't brush my teeth, um, and they end up prescribing something for that that's kind of like knocked that out within a few days, but that sucked. Um, another big thing is taste. Your taste buds get really messed up and you can't, don't taste things the same or things taste weird. Nothing really tastes good. Um, a lot of things taste more bitter or sour. Um, yeah, like, and then you want to eat spicy foods, but you really can't because that kind of breaks through it, but you really can't because you have, like, the mouth sore thing. So that really sucks. So the first, like, week is when I would have, like, the taste issue, and then it would kind of go down from there and kind of go back to normal before I had my next infusion. So as far as food, like, it, even though you're not nauseous, like, you don't necessarily have an appetite because nothing tastes good. Um, and you can, like, taste chemicals and stuff. Like, if a uh, pan was washed with like Dawn dish detergent, even if it was really well rinsed, I could still taste that, so we had to switch to like all natural detergents and stuff. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Oh, I had a lot of body pain, um, so like my skin just felt like it was bruised all the time. Um, so I really couldn't be touched for a, a long time just because it would hurt. Um, you, I wouldn't look bruised and I wouldn't get bruises, but it just looked, it was just painful. Um, just so I felt like I was bruised. And my lymph nodes would swell up, obviously, because this is attacking your immune system. Um, I had some points where my lymph nodes were, like, really big, so I felt like I was getting, like, a sore throat or something. Um, yeah, I had a little bit of, like, not skin darkening, but, like, certain parts of your skin will darken a little bit, so, like, scars will darken, and my teeth would get, like, not necessarily yellow, but just, like, a darker pigment that's kind of gone away. Um, is that everything? I mean, I feel like it's a lot, but that's the gist of it. I mean, like, the pain stuff is like the worst. Um, and then you just get really muddled as far as your thinking. Um, you, like I have a hard time even still like remembering things. And like I'll say a lot of videos, I don't know if I edited all of it out as far as on booktube videos, but I would say things wrong and I wouldn't even realize I was saying things wrong. I would just like say things like backwards, almost like it was like dyslexia but with speaking. Um, so that was weird. Um, and I would just like forget things as far as like work. I'm just like fuzzy, like I can't think straight. Like I can't do this because it's just really difficult because my brain's all foggy. And it's just chemo brain, like everyone calls it chemo brain. Um, because your body's just being like attacked. Because like people, I think you have a hard time if you don't have cancer or if you don't think about it, that like cancer isn't like, we think of diseases as something that's, that's infected us. Um, but cancer is like your body. Like cancer is your cells messing up and you know like mutating and not a cool way like x-men or something but mutating in like a negative way and so like the chemo is halfway killing you as well because like it's killing the cancer but the cancer is you so it just like completely like your brain doesn't know what to do because it's just like attacking everything and you know like it's just yeah it's just not a fun time obviously like chemo is never going to be a fun time but i think those are the gist of the issues that I had for the most part.